Quote, the port of Castries has had a very long history in the service of shipping in the Caribbean, starting with its prominent role as a refueling station for international shipping crossing the Caribbean during the latter part of the 19th century and the early 20th century. The development of the port of Castries today and of other ports in St. Lucia and the service which the Port Authority is committing itself to provide represents an understanding of the development projections of the economy of St. Lucia in particular and the economics of the territories of the CARICOM and the Caribbean Basin. Unquote. George C. Gerard. Hi, I'm Gina McPhee and this is Port Calls. Welcome to another episode of Port Calls, an inside look into one of the most important facets of St. Lucia, our ports, and the organization that managed it, SASPA. On this episode, we will focus on the Castry Seaport, one of the major engines fueling the broader economy of the country. Our opening quote by George C. Girard was part of the introduction printed in the December 1977 publication of the Port Authority, Portways of St. Lucia. It certainly underscored the importance of the port of Castries and the impact its subsequent development would have on the economy of St. Lucia then and remains even more relevant today. The port of Castries impacts every facet of this country. When you think of it, everything, food, fashion, electronics, medicine, lumber, raw materials from manufacturing, automobiles and parts, okay, this list will never end. Everything comes through our ports, most of it through Port Castries. The development of the port over the years has been a major factor in the development of the town and eventually the city of Castries, and by extension, the country. Let us take a brief look at the history of Port Castries, its development, expansion and growth over the years. Castries has always had a reputation of being a safe anchorage. The first badge granted to the island in 1880 featured a drawing of the harbour of Castries with the motto Satio Haud Malifida Carinis, or a safe harbour for ships. The motto was used on the first coat of arms of the island in 1939 and to this day remains on the arms of the city of Castries. In 1650, Fort au Puy de Petit Calissac, et de la Rivière du Carlinage, was founded by a group of 40 Frenchmen, led by Rousselin when St. Lucia was purchased from the French West Indian Company. It was originally called Carinage or Petit cul de sac because it was a landlocked harbour used for careening ships while under repairs. And in the days of sail when Winjamas roamed the Caribbean, this safe service earned for podcast trees the reputation and descriptive legend Sachio Haud Malifida Carinis. This is as true today as it ever was, a safe anchorage for ships. The original capital of St. Lucia was called La Petite Carinage and occupied what is now the Vichy Airport. But on account of the exposed nature of the terrain, it suffered severely from hurricanes. Transfer to the present site began in 1768 and in the hurricane of 1780, two houses were only left standing. The capital was moved to the south side of the harbour in 1769 by Governor Baron de Migu. In 1785, the Ville de Carinage was renamed Castries after Charles Eugène Gabriel Lacroix Marquis de Castries, the French Minister of the Navy and Colonies. By 1814, the British beat out the French for control of the island after the Battle of Cul de Sac. In 1835, the British built the Western Wharf in preparation for the coaling trade and the first steamship arrived in 1841, the RMS Solway. The development of the port has continued since then, with continuous improvement and innovation. On September 10, 1886, the first concrete cylinder was sunk on the Northern Wharf as transition from wooden to concrete piers began. The port became an important one during the 19th century for refueling military and cargo ships and has continued to grow since. Port Castries is considered to be one of the best sheltered natural anchorages in the world and as early as 1925, the British government made a decision to develop Castries as a central port in the region. 
the approach channel is 300 feet wide at a minimum depth of 6 fathoms to the port proper. The turning basin is 1,550 feet with a draft of 25 to 35 feet. In the late 1970s, two new berths were constructed, each capable of accommodating ocean-going vessels between 700 and 800 feet long, each with a draft of 35 to 38 feet. The development also included a transit shed with 40,000 square feet of space and 80,000 cubic feet of cold storage facilities to reef for cargo. Port Castries was also developed to facilitate the growing cruise industry, with the development of berthing facilities at Point Seraphine on the northern side of the harbour. Point Seraphine was changed from a fringe pier to a full berth during the years 1997 to 98, and currently boasts two berthing facilities. Booth 1, a 400-foot booth with breasting dolphins, was upgraded as recently as 2017 to accommodate the boothing of mega cruise vessels in excess of 1,100 feet and of a draft of 28 feet to 34 feet. Booth 2 has a length of 300 feet and can accommodate ships length 750 feet to 850 feet and a draft of 28 to 34 feet. In 2006, the GIST shed was transformed into a ferry terminal to accommodate ferry transportation between St. Lucia and the French islands and Dominica. Port Castries has developed into a modern-day port facility, moving from forklifts and pallets in the early days to a fully digitized network facility handling containerized cargo. The port has six berths available, ranging in length from 200 feet to 720 feet long, with drafts from 18 to 32 feet. Equipment includes a lever harbor mobile crane, reach stackers, reefer points, terminal tractors, and various weight class forklifts. Port Castries has won numerous awards over the last two decades, including Best OECS Best Port on numerous occasions. Let us take a quick break now. When we come back, we meet some of the personnel vital to the smooth operation of podcast trees. Welcome back to Port Cause. Well, as we introduce the port as the engine that fuels the broader economy, that engine itself is run by the many individuals who work like a perfectly synced oil machine to ensure the operations are run smoothly. SASPA employs over 400 personnel. And whilst we can't introduce you to all of them today, we will feature five individuals whose duties are vital to the smooth operation of the port. First, let's meet Leslie Sutherland. On a day-to-day -day basis, we have many different activities taking place all at once. So um, I had the team of supervisors, and each one is responsible for their sector. So they are um, supposed to ensure that their area is well covered and everything is running smooth. If there are any problems, then they would um, approach me and we either discuss it or um, I give them instructions. So basically, I'm uh, the guiding person of the department. That entails ensuring that all the services of the operations department run smoothly, which include the stuffing operations at the shed, cargo operations at the booths, all types, uh, liaising with cargo agents, um, shipping agents, um, discussing plans and activities with the team of supervisors, and just generally ensuring that um, we meet the needs of the customers at all times. Sometimes we have ships um, trying to schedule for the same time and the problems it causes is that we have to look at the, the different types of, of um, cargo to be discharged, the, the amount of work to be done um, and generally their requirements and how we can best meet their needs. Sometimes it, um, it entails a lot of discussion back and forth 
both internally and externally so that we have an understanding and an, an agreement so that the operations will turn out to be a smooth, a smooth um, process. Up next, Mr. Earl Sinclair, Supervisor, Seaport, Support Services. Well, the port is a very dynamic facility and what we entail is providing equipment for the services we provide at the port. That includes um, the loading of containers onto the haulers, the chassis, um, discharging um, containers from the vessels, also loading containers onto the vessels, both full and empty containers. We also provide services to clients, which is, um, which is um, rental of equipment to the clients. That includes, if you want to stuff your container on the wharf, we provide services such as um, forklifts and operators. We also provide special services, which include, um, we splash vessels into um, the water. That's um, some of our clients from Barbados, Trinidad, St. Vincent, they bring their boats into St. Lucia and we splash it in the water for them. Here is Miss Monica Louis, team lead shipping. I'm actually responsible for the shipping section and that shipping section is responsible for invoicing every operation that happens at Castry Seaport. And um, these transactions include overtime delivery, rental of equipment, um, invoicing vessels for um, invoicing agents for vessels that come to podcast trees um, excess storage whatever charges whatever transaction that happens at podcast trees um, the shipping section is responsible for invoicing so i just have to ensure that we accurately invoice our customers yes, sometimes we have customers who come to castries seaport to clear their goods and they would not realize that they need to work with um, proper documentation. For example, if you have a, your personal effects barrel, what have you, at the port, you would need to get delivery from your agent um, to come in with your out of charge note or your, and your BL to be able to get the details of whatever cargo you have at our ports to be charged. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you find persons are unaware that um, we have a five working days grace for um, their cargo that's been warehoused at um, the port. They come in with the expectation that they can um, clear their goods free, um, not knowing that you have five working days and after the five working days you will be charged per ton per day at a rate of $3.50. In this department, we use uh, a manifest, and this manifest we usually get from the shipping agent. The, the manifest gives us details of the containers or whatever cargo that comes to our port. We also use out-of-charge notes from the agent to calculate rent. Um, we use the tariff, and you would recognize that without the tariff, this department cannot operate because um, these are the taxes that's imposed by government on the goods and services that come to St. Lucia. If you do business at the shed, you will definitely meet this young lady, Sasha Fanis, data entry clerk. The primary duties of the shed clerk or shed keeper is to deliver goods that's a general cargo or container as well. In this setting is um, general cargo and to tally the goods entering the ports. That's making a record of the, all goods that come into the ports. When the customer comes into the shed, he goes to the office, he or she goes to the office to get a location for the items. Then they proceed to customs, who in turn will let them know if their goods require examination or if it's, it is just released without examination. Then. The customer will come to me. I will locate the items along with the forklift operator, take it either to the examination area or deliver it out of the port to them. We prepare uh, after examination and the goods are released by customs. We prepare a goods interchange receipt or commonly known as a gate pass. Then they can leave with their items. The strangest thing I've seen is um, Cops is being brought in by the medical schools, which actually have to be examined by customs along with the port health. And the stench is really bad. By far, this is the strangest. And finally, this young man, Larry James, who operates the Rich Stacker. On a day to day basis, we handle um, customers or, or external customers, which are the truckers. They come in with empty or full containers and 
these are placed in the stacks, the various stacks. Um, sometimes they come in with empties, which are placed in the um, proper stacks, and they take full ones, which they show us in the stack, and then we, we load them, whatever container that they, they desire. We use the rich stacker, it's so one behind me. Um, it's used to offload and load trucks. We had the in-house training, it was a few months. Um, I went up to nine months training. And after that, um, we, I got a probation period and whereby the authority now saw it was necessary that they, they pull me in as a restock operator. It has its challenges. I would not, um, I would not shy, for, shy away from that, that point, but it can be exciting in that um, on a daily basis, it's the amount of people that you meet, the truckers, uh, that is. Uh, with my situation, um, we meet the truckers, they are by various personalities. Sometimes you, you do things that are, we have a phrase they say in magic, which um, that we try to assist the best possible way that we can. We'll take another break now. When we return, more on podcast reads. Welcome back to Port Call. If you're just joining us, we're featuring the Castry Seaport. We've looked at the history of the port and some of the critical personnel who ensure it's smooth running. Now, all of this would not be possible without the vital linkages and third party agencies that ensure that the port is always open for business. Let us meet one of our agents, Tropical Shipping. First of all, we're a shipping company. So we have vessels that call port castries, bringing cargo in and taking cargo out of St. Lucia. We can't do that without some kind of port facility. And SLASPA is the port authority and also the operator. So SLASPA has a dual role. SLASPA is both a regulator and an operator of the terminal facility at Port Castries. So our interaction is that when our ship calls Port Castries, SLASPA provides a number of services to us. They provide stevedoring, they provide um, crane, port crane services. They, they provide berthing services to us at the terminal and, um, and they move the containers on and off the ship. The technology that SLASPA is employing to, to manage the operation has improved. So, and this gets a little bit technical, but when we are first to be able to release cargo to a customer, we have to have a manifest. And that manifest now is electronically uploaded to SLASPA's system. And the release for the cargo is electronically granted from our system to SLASPA's. So it, from that point of view, it has been, it has been a big improvement in terms of the relationship there because now it's all the, the release is all electronic now we couldn't say goodbye without first looking at the future of podcast trees it has served us well over the last century and a half and with the upcoming plans of development of port infrastructure it will augur well for the port of cast trees here is adrian hile on the future of podcast trees in podcast trees is a multi multi-use port mm -hmm. so at point surfing is dedicated for crews and on our side of the port, you have cargo and cruise. Um, SASPA, over the years, we have been looking at it, and we have to do something about it. Because unlike the cargo which container ships bring in here, it's captive cargo. It's cargo that must come to St. Lucia. When you look at cruise, we compete with all the islands in the region. So we have to make sure the service we provide is on power, better than what they'll get in a, in a, in a competing port. Even in Castries, when you look at Pont Seraphine, Pont Seraphine is only cruise. The cruise vessel comes on this side, say 3,000 passengers, 3,500, 
and they come off a booth which has a crane, which has cargo. I mean, it's not really sending the good message out. And what we want to do is to separate cargo and cruise. And again, like I say, you want to enhance your visitor experience. The very first experience when they come into St. Lucia and they see is what remains with them. So once we can separate the two, we can now create or replicate what's at Pond Surfing, whereby when you come, whether you go to Pond Surfing or you come on this side of the port, you have the same experience. The immediate term, I think, would be more geared towards how we can enhance the efficiencies. And we deal with both cargo and cruise, so we're looking at um, something that's very, going to have a very significant impact in St. Lucia. Um, when I say in St. Lucia, looking at the ease of doing business. So if at the port, like I said, the port is, a, is part of the supply chain, if we can reduce costs at the port, then that goes towards enhancing St. Lucia's ranking in the ease of doing business. So in the mid term or the short term, mid term, I can say, how can we increase operational efficiencies? That's um, doing training, looking at our processes, what we can automate. And in the longer term would be the actual separation of cargo and crews. Unlike in some of those um, European countries I've visited, whereby if you have to do repairs to a booth, you can simply put it out of commission and vessels go to another booth. We don't have this type of privileges in St. Lucia is the one booth. And it's something that the port takes very seriously because when you look at Castro Seaport, 90% of the goods come in by sea. And it's only the very high value products which will come in by air. So we, people feel whatever happens at the port. And our main goal is to, to the cruise experience to make it a more, um, make it more competitive to that of our, our, the other destination ports. And on the cargo side, try to reduce the cost of cargo by being operationally more efficient. Portcasters used to win a lot of competitions. Um, they have had some changes in the port industry, whereby you have international port operators um, coming in to manage ports. And that's all of port development. In Senator, the port authority, we, we the port authority and we also the port operators. We'll take another break now. When we come back, we'll wrap up today's show. Ah, podcast trees. We've gone from murky tropical mangroves to bustling seaports. From petite carinage to podcast trees. We've gone from sails to steam to diesel, from schooners to ocean liners. We've fought wars from cannons perched high atop mountains of fortune to silence submarines and torpedoes deep below secure waters of the harbor. We've been the coal capital of the Caribbean, a booming banana republic a safe haven for military ships during conflict. We've gone from coal and bananas carried on the heads of women into waiting vessels, to small forklifts and pallets, to containers and cranes taller than most buildings in the town. We've gone from written manifests in giant journals, to digital databases and internet. We've come a long way, podcasteries. There's no doubt the port will remain a vital part of development of this country, impacting the lives of everyone, from food to fashion, from transport to comfort, and business to pleasure. 
After all, we compliment your every move. See you next time on PodCall. When packing your carry-on bag, keep in mind the 311 liquids rule. Liquids, gels, aerosols, creams and pastes should not exceed 3.4 ounces or 100 milliliters per container. This includes items such as toothpaste, gel deodorants, shampoos, lotions and similar personal care items. Consumables like bottled water, peanut butter and jams must also comply with the rule. All liquids must fit into one quart-sized clear plastic zip-top bag and only one bag is allowed per customer. That's 311. There are some exceptions if you have special needs or children. You may bring prescription and over-the-counter medicines, baby formula, breast milk, juice and other essential liquids in quantities larger than 3.4 ounces. Please present these items to security officers at the checkpoint because they may require alternative screening. For more information on Travel 311, go to slasper.com. This message brought to you by the Airline Operators Committee of St. Lucia.